So, uh, I'm talking about aortic valve uh, sparing operations, and uh, you might ask, who is it for? Uh, it basically boils into populations of patients that have pure aortic uh, aneurysms, uh, say ascending and aortic root, where the aortic valve is essentially normal in structure and function. Uh, or there's another cohort of patients who have um, aortic regurgitation uh, with really minimal disturbance of the uh, aortic diameters that are sufficiently to cause severe uh, aortic regurgitation. Uh, and those uh, valves can be structurally normal trileaflet or even bicuspid valves. Or, of course, you can get any combinations thereof. Uh, first question to ask is why bother? We've got some good um, prosthesis these days, uh, we believe, uh, and they're easy to insert and generally have reasonable hemodynamics. But you've heard from Peter's talk that uh, there's a number of the issues ranging from inconvenience uh, to life-threatening complications. And um, uh, so much so that uh, the outlook for patients receiving aortic valve replacement, be it mechanical or by prosthetic, is significantly curtailed. And, and the difference uh, in, in the uh, longevity uh, is more stark the younger the patient is. Uh, of course, uh, the bugbear of uh, bioprosthesis is reoperation, while uh, of the mechanical is the, uh, the uh, bleeding. Uh, then we have the Ross operation, which has uh, uh, been outlined by Peter. And, uh, you know, this is the only uh, prosthesis that's been shown to have a, uh, a normal life expectancy for matched uh, population, so that's certainly a, a dramatic um, uh, contrast. Uh, the Achilles of this uh, um, procedure, though, is uh, reoperation, and uh, uh, the reoperation risk uh, increases with the passage of time. So that, uh, uh, on average, uh, there's about a 10% reoperate at the 10-year mark, uh, and slightly more for children. Uh, this is overall uh, reoperations, but uh, when you look at uh, the different sites, uh, if it's in the uh, aortic uh, position, uh, there's a very high uh, incidence of uh, needing to reoperate if a, a root replacement technique uh, unsupported is used. Uh, this is mitigated to a large extent by having a supported root or uh, the less common uh, subcoronary implant uh, technique. Uh, but there's also the issue with the second valve and the, the, the pulmonary homograft. Uh, although it's a great uh, substitute, it's, it's not perfect. Uh, and again, there's a, a certain incidence of uh, drop-off uh, from the pulmonary valve. Uh, so we've uh, rendered the patient uh, dependent on, on two valve prostheses rather than one. Now, nobody would argue that if you have a, a valve like this, it's going to need to be replaced. But uh, why should we throw a valve like this in the bucket? Uh, you've already seen the, uh, the anatomy displayed. Uh, and the point to make here is that uh, unlike the mitral valve, where all the action happens on a two-dimensional plane, uh, uh, the, all the action in the aortic valve is on a three-dimensional plane and uh, we've got to talk about two levels of uh, annulus, the sinotubular junction and, and the basal ring or the ventricular aortic junction. Uh, and it's the, the, uh, in the mitral valve we're only talking about one plane, in the aortic we're talking about two planes. So we've got to be able to visualise 3D anatomy when we repair these valves. And, um, and not only that, but there's a very complex interrelationship of the geometries of the various sizes, um, which has been actually worked out quite a long time ago. Uh, but if you notice the, the position of the leaflets in the closed uh, situation, they look like the hands praying. And there's a reason for this, and, and the reason for that is that uh, if they were to close horizontal, uh, on a horizontal plane, uh, the diastolic pressure would be working very hard to to uh, make them uh, leak, whereas by having a, a bit of an inclination, some of the vectors of the, uh, the, the diastolic pressure actually work to hold the uh, zone of coarptation tighter. Uh, you've already seen this diagram of uh, the uh, physiological mechanisms of, of uh, aortic regurgitation, and, and basically the, this complex area here of the type 1 is the equivalent of the annular dilatation in, in mitral regurgitation except that we've got to take into account that it might be happening at different levels. Uh, 
Prolapse is actually a relatively common finding uh, in patients, um, not only in bicuspid but also in advanced trileaflet uh, regurgitation. And the, the cusp restriction is uh, not just um, in rheumatic disease but uh, often uh, very common in, in bicuspid valve disease. So just to run through an illustration of some of these, uh, this is the so-called STJ dilatation. The typical patient is an elderly female uh, who has had a, a long-standing ascending uh, aortic aneurysm which starts to then encroach on the uh, aortic root and spreads the, uh, the um, commissures apart and uh, you get a central regurgitation as a consequence. And there's a diagram of what's happening. Uh, the, um, the, as the leaflets run from one commissure to the other, uh, as that distance spread, uh, so then the uh, free margin is not able to meet its corresponding one in the middle and you get a gap in the middle. Uh, I have to say that this is a relatively, in a pure form, is a relatively infrequent uh, situation and uh, uh, doing an operation to purely correct the sinotubular junction is, is basically a, a palliative operation in a very elderly patient. Uh, this is the typical uh, pattern that you would see from, say, a Marfan's patient with a... Uh, dilatation of all the dimensions, the sinotubular, the sinuses and the uh, annulus. And uh, again, you would expect central uh, regurgitation with this. And this is the uh, pathophysiology of what's happening. The, the leaflets are bases so far apart that they can't meet in the middle. Um, this actually induces a, a secondary change in the free margins, which are trying to get together and they consequently elongate and this needs to be taken into account when you're operating on these patients in the late phase that when you correct the diameters you're actually going to have a residual prolapse and that could lead to failure. Uh, leaflet prolapse is, is uh, an underappreciated uh, uh, pathology. Uh, quite often p patients won't have a hugely dilated uh, root. They might have a normal sized root or slightly dilated. Uh, but the, the thing that's pathognomonic uh, on the echo is a, the very eccentric nature of the regurgitation. Of course, the jet hits the side opposite to the leaflet that's prolapsing. But uh, you get this uh, knee bend sign on the, on the echo. If you ever see that, you know that you've got prolapse. And you can, when you open up and have a look, you can actually see that, uh, that bend. Uh, you get a distinct crease in the leaflet that's uh, prolapsing. And of course you don't need much prolapse before you get severe regurgitation because one leaflet's uh, at a different plan than the others. So the goals of uh, valve sparing uh, root repair are as follows. Uh, one needs to return a normal surface of carpitation. And this, uh, this requires that you have normal uh, dimensions of both the base and the sinotubular junction according to the leaflet surface area. So what you have given is the leaflet surface area. You can't really change that. You can't make it bigger unless you add extraneous tissue. Uh, so everything else has to work around uh, what, the, what you've got as leaflets. Uh, you also need to make sure that leaflet suspension level is, is adequate, and we'll come to that. And finally, it's not much good getting a, a competent valve if you're going to leave them with aortic stenosis. So they have to have good leaflet opening mobility. And finally, uh, all aneurysmal tissue has to be removed. You can't uh, do this operation and leave them with dilated aorta. So you've got to be prepared to repair uh, arch or descending associated with this. So I mentioned before, correction of ST, pure STJ dilatation is easy. Uh, you're going to replace the ascending aorta anyway. Uh, and it's a matter of, of um, correcting the diameter at the side of the junction. Uh, but for the serious uh, repair, uh, we've basically got two models of, um, of repairing this. Uh, the uh, the so-called Yakub or remodeling procedure where the ascending aorta and sinuses are excised uh, and then the coronary buttons are put back in versus the reimplantation or the David procedure where uh, the, um, replace, the replacement goes right down to the left ventricular outflow tract and encases the, uh, the leaflets as well as the interleaflet uh, triangle. Uh, to add to this, um, a lot of the objections to the Yakub procedure has been that um, you, know, you leave that area underneath the, the triangles unprotected and as time goes by uh, it will dilate even if it wasn't dilated to start with and end up uh, in aortic regurgitation. 
the criticism of the, uh, the David procedure is that you're encasing everything in a rigid graft and you get uh, suboptimal hemodynamics and perhaps trauma on the leaflets as they're opening and hitting the, the encasement. Uh, and more recently we've seen modifications of this um, uh, as popularised by Dr Lansack uh, where you can have a separate annuloplasty uh, at the base to control the annulus at the base and then uh, replace the sinuses in the STJ and thereby retain some mobility that's available in the native uh, interleaflet trigone. Uh, so the principle of the David procedure or reimplantation procedure is to take down the root uh, completely, leaving uh, a skeleton of, uh, of uh, the, the, the valve attachment um, and obviously the coronary arteries on, on uh, buttons. Uh, and then a row of sutures is placed on the left ventricular airflow tract below the uh, valve level, uh, through which uh, then they go to the, through the base of an appropriately sized graft. Uh, the graft is lowered onto that uh, outflow tract, uh, then the uh, commissures and the uh, remnant of the aorta is sewn inside the graft to resuspend the valve, and finally the coronaries are attached. And uh, I'll just take you through some of these steps. Um, firstly, the valve uh, assess assessment. Uh, it's important that the uh, commissures are placed on under tension so that one can appreciate uh, uh, exactly what's going on because the aorta is uh, depressurized now and those uh, sutures mimic uh, the pressurized situation. You can see in this, in this valve there's uh, uh, already you can appreciate that there's severe annular dilatation and the leaflets are struggling to meet in the middle. Sorry. And then um, the uh, root preparation uh, Unlike the ascending aorta, which is relatively free in the pericardium, uh, the aortic root is attached to all those surrounding stru structures that you've heard about before. So we've got to physically separate them. Uh, so posteriorly, uh, separating it off uh, the left main uh, attachments and the pulmonary artery. just see the uh, left main appearing there. This is off the uh, right ventricle, right ventricular alpha tract, heading into the region of the right coronary. Uh, and then finally from around the uh, roof of the left atrium. So then we can end up with a completely freed aortic root right down to the LVOT level. Uh, at this stage we can also address uh, leaflet uh, prolapse. So in a trileaflet valve we can use the normal two leaflets as the reference and here the right and left are the uh, correct length whereas the non is elongated uh, and then a suture is used in the free margin to plicate the extra tissue uh, in that leaflet and thereby reduced its free margin back to the uh, level of the others. Uh, then the proximal suture line, um, working within the cavity in the outflow tract below the level of the um, attachment of the aortic valve. A row of sutures is inserted and uh, then the commissures are tucked in to get them out of the way and the appropriate size uh, graft is lowered into it. And then uh, the uh, commissures are delivered back inside the, um, the Dacron tube and uh, resuspended under the uh, correct tension level. So then you've got the three commissures suspended uh, and all that's left is the remnant, the aortic remnant uh, that needs to be sutured to the new aortic root. And this is the, um, the suture line that's responsible for hemostasis.
And uh, once you've done this, uh, you can get an idea of how the valve sits and uh, how it copes. And then finally, the uh, coronary arteries are inserted. This is pretty pr routine procedure, as in a Bentall's operation. <coughs> and finally, that's what you'd like to see. Doesn't seem like much uh, for all the work that's gone in there. Uh, the Yakub, uh, or the remodeling technique, uh, prepares the route pretty much the same as. Uh, as before, perhaps not going quite as low on the outflow tract as you do for the uh, uh, reimplantation. And then the Necron graft is fashioned with three tongues to substitute for the sinuses. And then finally the coronaries are put on. And you can see this uh, in slide format, the fashioning of the, of the tongues. And then uh, the, the appropriate uh, comma shores are switched into place. The tongues are you know, fine-tuned to the space and then each tongue is sutured separately to the remnant of the sinus. And that's what you like to see at the end. Uh, so I've mentioned how we repair prolapse um, using basically the reference point. If, if two leaflets are normal, uh, they're used as a reference point and then you stretch the third leaflet to coincide on one side and then stretch it back on the other side and match them and you can end up with uh, a, a layer of sutures over there which then uh, corrects the, the elongation. Now if you've got extensive uh, uh, elongation or if you've got a lot of uh, what's called fenestry holes in the uh, free margins of the leaflets then you need something more and uh, one technique that's been advocated is the use of Gore-Tex suture to run as a, a weaving uh, technique along the free margin. Um, that's fallen a little bit in, into a um, bit of disrepute because they have a tendency to, to calcify and uh, uh, I think that um, if that degree of degeneration is present in the leaflet it's probably not worth saving. Now th this is a key slide uh, and it tells you what, what the prognosis of the repair is. Uh, it, it's all very well to get um, a competent repair at the end of the procedure but if you've got uh, your level of coaptation too far down in the, uh, in the aortic root then you, you can safely predict that you're going to have a very short uh, run on this. And uh, if, if the valve leaflets coapt nicely in the middle, uh, at about the mid-sinus level, then the prognosis is excellent. If they uh, reach the base or even below, uh, so effectively they're, they're prolapsing, but they're prolapsing symmetrically, so you're not noticing regurgitation necessarily, but, but they're low, the outlook is, is uh, appalling. And, and this is why uh, we may get into trouble with treating, uh, um, doing valve sparing operations, particularly in patients with large aneurysms or advanced aortic regurgitation, because uh, we, we're assuming that those leaflets are completely normal, and the only problem is that uh, they've been, uh, uh, the, the diameters have been uh, altered, but in, in, in effect they've been stretched over time, their free margins lengthened. So when you, re when you render their, their uh, diameters back towards normal, um, what you end up is, is inducing a fall in the uh, suspension level of the leaflets. And uh, in order to prevent this, um, there's a nice uh, caliper that's been developed by Schaefer's uh, where you can uh, emulate the effect of uh, blood pressure by ironing out the leaflets and then you can measure how high the uh, leaflets rise above the, uh, the base. And uh, if you can achieve a, a height level of... Uh, uh, eight millimeters or more, uh, then that portends a good outlook. So th this leads to, um, uh, you know, the uh, the requirements for for a successful repair. Uh, you need coaptation of all three leaflets at the same level. Obviously, you can't have any uh, one that's coopting lower. Uh, we'd aim for the uh, level of coaptation to be at the mid sinus level. Uh, we'd like a coaptation length of um, greater than four millimeters. Uh, and that there's no, no uh, eccentric AR at all, and at, at worst, uh, mild central AR. Um, 
And uh, of course, uh, it's very important to get good leaflet mobility. As I said, you're going to have minimal gradients in these valves at the end. So uh, this is an example of a bad repair. You can see everything's wrong with it. The leaflets co at below the level of the annulus. There's an, uh, a, a large eccentric jet. Uh, and this is a good repair. Uh, the coarptation level is well up in the uh, midpoint of the coronary sinuses. Uh, and there's a long uh, amount of coarptation zone. Uh, and the effective uh, leaflet height is quite uh, tall. What about bicuspid valves? Uh, we've heard they're very common congenital condition, 1 to 2% of the population. Uh, it's really both a valve and an aortic disease. Um, and compared to tricuspid valves, they, they have a much higher incidence of valvular abnormalities, um, higher incidence of uh, aortic dilatation, and for a given a aortic di dimension, a higher incidence of aortic complications. And they also occur at a younger age. So if you compare them to the normal population, uh, with the average being there and the upper limit uh, being there, uh, there's, a, there's a, certainly a significant uh, enlargement for age for age. And also the rate of growth is bigger. Uh, they grow at about five times faster than a normal aorta. Uh, the configurations can be um, quite different. Um, the, you can have uh, a dilated ascending aorta with a totally normal root. You can have a, a dilated root with a normal ascending aorta. Uh, or you can have both, obviously. And uh, the aorta can be enlarged uh, either in the, in the uh, ascending level, it can be purely in the root level, uh, or it can be a combination of that and it can extend into the aortic arch. And uh, interestingly, uh, uh, quite a significant number of patients actually extend into the proximal uh, arch, into the level of the innominate or uh, as is uh, very frequent in these patients, uh, a, com a common origin of the uh, innominate and uh, carotid to form what's called a bovine configuration. Uh, just a point on the geometry of the, um, of the uh, bicuspid versus uh, trileaflet and why it's uh, inherently uh, not physiological. Um, and it all relates to pi because pi is close enough to three and uh, uh, if you imagine the free margin of each leaflet has to cover uh, the uh, run from one end to the other to, to go to the center, so a free margin should really be uh, equal to the diameter of the circle, and yet with, when they're open, three of the leaflets would equal to three times that, which is pi. Whereas if you've got a bicuspid valve, you've only got two times that. And uh, so therefore, you've either got to make your, um, uh, y either you're going to be correct at the time of closure, in which case when it comes to opening, they're going to be too short and you'll get stenosis, uh, or they're going to be open at the time of uh, open, uh, they're going to be fully open at the time of um, injection, but uh, uh, prolapse when they uh, when they close and give regurgitation. And so inherently, the uh, the bicuspid valve is going to have a longer free margin than it should, and inherently the coarptation uh, level is going to be lower and that angle uh, shorter. So they really have things stacked up against them uh, for confidence. Uh, you've seen the slide about the different types. I won't labour that, but uh, just to mention that also um, that they have um, uh, different levels of fusion. They can vary from totally fused to being only minimally fused. Uh, and also the, uh, the angle of the commissures can vary from a totally 180 degree to 120 degree. The, the mainstay of repair is uh, uh, the prolapsed uh, con uh, fused leaflet. Uh, and. Uh, the, the, uh, the, the easiest form of repair is to actually placate that leaflet and then compare it to the, uh, the non-fused leaflet for, for um, equ equality of, of length. Again, you can use the Gore-Tex uh, reinforcement. Um, this, uh, these techniques have been uh, developed by um, Lansac, uh, where uh, it's a combination of, um, of uh, reimplantation, uh, sorry, of, of remodeling and uh, a separate annuloplasty. Uh, and in fact, in my experience, that's shown to be a very useful technique for bicuspid valves. And the aim, one aims to make them 180 degrees because that gives you the best uh, long-term success. Uh, you can, in fact, do these repairs without having to replace the whole of the aorta. Uh, you can slide the, um, the uh, ring underneath the coronaries without having to take them off. And uh, halfway house is to replace the non-coronary sinus uh, versus the others. And 
if it's a totally normal aortic root, you can, you can just use the annuloplasty by itself and correct the prolapse. Uh, our, just to summarise our experience from uh, up to a couple of years ago, we've done about 150 uh, valve sparing, uh, initially tri-leaflet and then we moved into the bicuspid repairs, uh, had an overall uh, mortality of 2.7. Uh, all these patients have either been uh, problems with dissection or uh, associated with um, arch repair or, or severely impaired ventricles. Uh, and there was a 2% stroke rate. Uh, we've had very uh, extensive follow-up. And uh, the overall survival is 88% at seven years. Interestingly, uh, uh, a lot of the deaths have not been uh, related to uh, the valve or heart as such except for the uh, endocarditis. 89% um, freedom from uh, reoperation. We had seven reoperations, of which three were successfully re-repaired and uh, four required uh, replacement. And uh, that rate has dropped off as time, obviously, with experience as to, A, firstly, firstly which valve to select, and secondly, um, you know, the, the technical uh, uh, details. Uh, there was unfortunately one patient that presented with severe endocarditis and uh, aortic root abscess and also had developed uh, liver uh, decompensation from continuing to drink and uh, they died from uh, reoperation. Uh, there were 88% um, freedom from uh, significant aortic regurgitation. Uh, I mentioned we've reoperated on seven. The three that are being observed uh, having a moderate degree of aortic regurgitation without any change in their ventricular size or function. Uh, to look at the uh, results overall, um, the, um, the, the main Achilles of these uh, procedures is the reoperation rate. So the, the, the reoperation re is about 1% per year um, linearized. Uh, on the other hand, the complications of uh, thromboembolism and bleeding is a lot lower uh, than you'd expect from a prosthetic valve. And uh, again, as illustrated in this diagram, the, the harder you, your patients to start with, in other words, the, the, the more aortic regurgitation they've got at the, uh, at the beginning, uh, the less successful is, is the outcome. And that's to be expected because the leaflets have suffered uh, quite severely before they've come to surgery. Uh, in the Marfan subgroup, um, really some excellent results have been achieved. So the Marfan's is not a contraindication. And uh, the outlook, uh, even though the reoperation rate is, is uh, bigger than that of a mechanical uh, ventils, the complication rate is a, is a lot lower. Um, looking at specific centres of excellence, uh, like uh, Dr. Al Khoury's group from uh, Brussels, Again, same sort of freedom from significant uh, regurgitation. Uh, no, no real difference between bicuspid and tri-leaflet repairs. And from uh, Dr. David's series, which is uh, going out to 20 years, um, his main message was that uh, the uh, remodeling technique didn't do as well in his hands as the reimplantation, uh, although they've re subsequently reanalyzed this and, and the group that did uh, poorly with the remodeling has been the Marfan's uh, group and not, and not uh, the older patients. So in conclusion, uh, aortic valve repair and uh, root sparing operations are a safe alternative to aortic valve replacement. They offer the freedom from anticoagulants and uh, reduce prosthetic valve complication. The durability is certainly good in the medium term and uh, at least one series has shown them to be good in the long term. Uh, but that vitally depends on good case selection and operating team experience. Um, for those that are looking at easy cases to start with, there'd be younger patients, uh, not too much else in the way of comorbidities, uh, little or no AI and uh, early aneurysms rather than advanced aneurysms and hopefully not having to do an arch in the same time. Uh, these patients should be carefully assessed on intraoperative uh, and preoperative echo and also by visual inspection. And uh, post-repair, the criteria on echo that I've outlined and that Ian will go into more detail have to be heeded, otherwise you're, you're built for, for failure. The other point to make is that uh, uh, with experience, you get to know 
what you, what you should see at the end. And uh, if you've made an error, it's not a total disaster because uh, uh, for a short recross -clamp, re clamp time, you can adjust uh, leaflet uh, height and uh, change something that's suboptimal and something that's perfect. Uh, so, so one shouldn't give up too easily. Thank you very much.